Ya, mulai dari situ sudah bisa dibiasiswakan. Oh, uh, beda sih Pak ininya. <laughs> kalau, kalau, kalau pembe apa beasiswa Australia Awards nanti memang wajib mengikuti training dulu di Bali atau di Jakarta. Tapi uh, IALF sendiri itu kan lembaga kursus juga kan ya Pak. Jadi mereka juga punya program kursus bahasa Inggris juga begitu. Terima kasih informasi. Nah, salahnya ini kan anu ya salah satu kendala kita di sini untuk punya program untuk iya. faktor bahasa. Selalu begitu ya Pak. Selalu tentang bahasa Inggris biasanya. <laughs> Lebih-lebih untuk S3 ya Bu Endang kemarin pasti lebih benar, apa? Benar. Pasti kan waktu mendaftar. Daftarnya. Uh, tapi ini sementara saya kasih tapi untungnya itu um, um, Astana Award Scholarship kasih sedikit apa mild itu untuk Indonesia hmm. jadi saya bisa apply dengan 6 oh ya Indonesia Barat kan 6,5 Bu <laughs> kalau untuk S3 sama-sama 6 sih Bu cuman untuk yang oh, gitu S2 ya? memang iya sama-sama oh, 6 gitu. tapi Aku untuk itu. yang S2 baru uh, ada perbedaan oh, karena kan. kalau S3 memang jauh lebih kompetitif Jumlah beasiswa yang ditawarkan juga cuma hmm, sedikit. Jadi iya, kemarin itu dari dua, lebih benar, tinggi. Iya. Benar. Kemarin itu tahun saya itu kan dari 220 atau 250 kan 20. 250. Hmm. Nah, jadi 200-an yang S2 20. S2, Cuma 15% yang diberikan. Iya. Iya. Di sampai hanya Australia Award saja yang di BIA negara-negara lain juga Iya <tuh> bisa semuanya di Southern Court di SU berapa orang Indonesianya Bu Endang uh, di Southern Cross ini um, ada yang dari Medan satu orang oh, Oke okay. terus yang yang banyak kan sudah pulang sih ada baru barusan pulang itu dua orang tapi udah master sudah selesai jadi kalau tidak salah cuma berdua kalau yang dari hmm. Award ya Iya Iya tidak terlalu banyak ya sebenarnya ya, ya. Gak Kalau tahu. beasiswa lain juga ada ya Ibu ya? Di Southern Cross? Iya. Iya ada sih, ada. Oh, ada juga. Nah, orang Indonesia yang di sana di Southern Cross University itu ada berapa orang? Oh, orang Indonesia nggak banyak di sini. Nggak banyak. Banyak ya? Nggak <laughs> banyak. Di sini kan daerah apa kayak agak countryside ya, jadi hmm. beda kayak Sydney dulu banyak orang Asia gitu. <laughs> Kalau di sini agak banyak kan ini <laughs> orang lokal. Mm-mm. Ibu Endang masih di sana ya? Ya, ya. Bu Tuti, oh. saya tahun lalu baru datang. Oh. <laughs> saya kira sudah kembali ke Ambon. Ya, teman baiknya Prof. Mendi itu. Tapi dari Unpadi memang ada ya, termasuk Prof. Bob Mose itu dari SCM ya? Tidak, no, dari Tone Steel Pro. Oh, no. Tapi alumni Astrona Award nih, kalau tidak salah juga. Ini di kampus? Iya, ini di kampus. Dingin juga itu kalau musim dingin. Sudah mulai ada kegiatan di kampus ya Bu Endang ya? Kami waktu kalau lockdown, aktivitas kampus ke lapangan masih tetap beraktivitas. Yang penting jaga jarak, terus oh, ada iya. kayak di mobil hanya satu atau dua orang, begitu. Pokoknya um, ada rule-nya lah, tapi masih bisa beraktivitas. Hanya saja um, kuliah tidak ada, kalau yang S2 itu tidak ada kuliah, cuma online. Kelasnya tidak ada ya? Iya, kelasnya tidak ada. Oh. Tapi kalau ada juga kasus corona di sana Ibu Endang. Kalau di sini, Wismur cuma lima orang, nggak naik-naik hmm. sekarang. Hmm. Bagus. <laughs> iya. Itu berapa semester untuk kandungnya, teorinya? Oh, enggak. Kalau di Australia nggak ada teori, langsung... Langsung penelitian ya? Iya, langsung proposal. Ya. Kemudian sembilan bulan sudah harus konfirmasi. Lalu sekarang udah mulai dengan... Bapak penelitian. Sekarang sudah setengah ya? Sekarang. Setengah perjalanan. Iya, <laughs> Bapak penelitian. Chapter 1, Bapak penelitian sudah jalan. Sudah Lalu, eh, biasanya berapa lama? Berapa tahun? Siswa saya, di, di, biasanya 
nggak uh, tahu ya yang saya baca di Southern Cross University punya kontrak dengan saya itu harus selesai sebelum Juli 2023. Sebelum Juli 2023. Juli 2023. Kesempatan bulan baru 2020. Masih <laughs> ada tiga tahun ke depan. Tiap tahun kan harus berapa chapter gitu? Empat <laughs> sampai lima chapter jadi kejar-kejar cucu. <laughs> apa kuliah sudah tua jadi agak lambat gitu dia punya tidak <laughs> apa-apa tuntut ilmu kan tidak ada batas umur apa um, teman-teman ya. semua anak-anak ya. muda kan di sini anak-anak muda 24 dari 25 26 itu yang lagi ambil itu kan membuat kita jadi muda kembali kan <laughs> dengan orang muda kan semangatnya harus mengimbangi dia <laughs> jadi malah hati berapa <laughs> cuma baik-baik jadi belajar dari mereka. Anak-anak semua di sini dia ya. Iya. Kecuali yang tua ya. Yang tua. Partisipan sudah berapa? Sudah berapa? Hah? Tiga ratus empat lima? Oh tiga empat lima baru. Mana sih, Mas? Ada Profat Loli juga. Profat Loli. Selamat sore, Pak. Oh, Pak Rektor sudah masuk. Ya, selamat sore, Pak. Selamat sore, Pak Rektor. Selamat sore, Pak. Sore, Pak. Ya. Ada dosen kita satu, Prof, di Lismore tuh, Ibu Endang. Ibu Endang. Ya, Prof, setahu soalnya tiap Pak, minta tanda tangan terus, dua tahun berturut, minta tangan terus. <laughs> Apply untuk Australian Award. Selamat sore, Pak. Tidak terdengar, Pak, suaranya. Pak, maaf, tidak terdengar. Ada di stand. Iya. Kau pakai laptop, Pak. Coba tes audio dulu Iya Evan, unmute on tua dong Evan Yes belum terdengar Pak <laughs> Maaf tidak terdengar Pak Ini eh, tersandar-sandar tuh Iya putus-putus Ya
kelas 8 terus. Ada ibu bisa dengar? Nah, nah, ini bagus Pak, sangat jelas. Oke, eh, sangat jelas Prof. Oh, ya, pakai headset. Ya. Nah, bisa dengar kami Pak? Bisa bisa ibu. Ya, baik. Terima kasih Pak. Di sini sudah ada uh, dari Australia Award Pak dua orang, Ibu Tuti Rahayu sama Ibu Nindia. Iya. Selamat siang Bapak. Selamat siang Ibu Tuti. Kabar Ibu baik Nindia. Pak. Hujan nah. di Ambon terus nih Bu. <laughs> Kami yang kepanasan ini Pak di sini. Iya, kita dari malam di pagi hujan baru agak tenang sebentar nih. Iya, kami sudah masuk kemarau nih di sini. Iya, Bu. Perkuliahan masih jalan terus Pak atau sedang online? Iya, sementara online Bu. Nanti bulan Juli ini sudah ujian. Bulan Juli, tapi tetap online. Masih online juga ya, Pak? Ya, tetap online. Tidak boleh datang ke kampus. Betul. Semuanya masih di rumah. Iya, semua di rumah. Berarti semester depan masih online juga ya, Pak? Sampai akhir ya. tahun ya? Ter tergantung perintah Jakarta. Kita ikut aja sama gugus tugas. Tapi sementara ini mulai semester semester depan dimulai masih dengan online. Ya malah hari Minggu kita tes masuk perguruan tinggi SBMPTN itu hmm. disuruh masuk ke kampus. Ini juga oh. bahaya nih, Bu. Anak-anak yang mau tes itu sudah datang pakai standar kesehatan. Hmm. Oh, jadi tes langsung di tempat. UTBK, ya. Pakai komputer, Bu. Oh. Ya, ini sekolah semuanya di rumah ini. Online semua. Ya. Tapi di Ambon bagaimana, Pak, kondisinya untuk COVID ini? Meningkat terus, Bu. 2.500 lebih. Oh, ya. Jadi memang harus masih Iya, informasi ya, terakhir sudah naik sampai mendekati 700 katanya Bu. Ini. Hmm. Hari 704, Bro. Iya. Oh, Cuma kalau sudah ada yang kena memang setiap hari akan pertambahannya yeah. akan besar pasti. Karena yeah, klasternya menjadi berkembang. cadangan Ibu Tutik berarti ini nggak ada expo ya Bu ya atau eksponya online Bu biasanya kami belum tahu Ibu Wilma kebetulan jadwalnya kan untuk expo itu biasanya akhir tahun ya mulai oh. bulan jadi September, Desember, Desember, Januari itu jadwal kami untuk untuk outreach sebenarnya. Nah, kami belum belum tahu ini karena sulit diprediksi ya. Sejauh ini kami masih menggunakan rencana yang ada, tetapi ya seperti Pak Rektor tadi bilang semuanya menunggu menunggu update ya. Kalau kami diminta untuk menggunakan online, kami akan menggunakan online. Tapi kalau sudah diperbolehkan untuk tatap muka ya mungkin beberapa kami lakukan tatap muka karena kalau traveling kami belum boleh di traveling di dalam negeri ya kami belum dibolehkan. Ya kemungkinan uh, menggunakan online nih Bu. Karena seleksi pun kita juga belum tahu ini nanti untuk yang yang sekarang ini kita belum tahu apakah wawancaranya mau online atau tatap muka kita itu pun juga belum tahu kami 
Jadi sampai dengan bulan Juli sih semua kegiatan masih masih jarak jauh ibu belum. Dan itu sepertinya per bulan kami baru bisa membuat perencanaan gitu ya. Menunggu update dari pemerintah juga. Iya, enggak seperti tahun lalu ya waktu di Ambon itu yang kegiatannya banyak dari AAS juga datang ya. Iya, yang... iya. Tapi semoga kalau dengan online juga akan banyak banyak yang mengikuti juga ya. Kemarin kami membuat webinar yang dari NTT itu juga banyak yang di Makassar yang dengan Ikama itu juga sampai 500-an peserta. Jadi mungkin online justru lebih lebih mencakup lebih banyak audiens ya Bu ya. Semoga. Jadi semoga dengan online tidak mengurangi informasi yang kami berikan ke calon peserta. Oh, bagaimana Australia dingin? Iben kan, <laughs> lumayan pro. <laughs> Ibu Endang Ya Ibu Wilma Apa kabar Kabar baik Ini Ibu Wilma ini teman seperjuangan Cari beasiswa dulu ya Ya, ya kan dari berapa puluh tahun Dua sepuluh tahun yang lalu ya Dari sepuluh tahun yang lalu Teman sekamar ya, Teman sekamar Untuk kursus IELTS ya. 6 bulan Ibu Iya, empat bulan, empat bulan nih makasih. Empat, iya. Di Unhas. Iya. Kalau pas apa, Daniel Hanapi sih di mana yang benar? Di Flinders, Adelaide. Oh, Flinders. Ya. Jadi dua orang ya dari empat. Ibu Endang dengan Pak Daniel. Hmm. Jadi harapannya yang dari Ternate itu domba, apa tahun ini kan tiga tuh yang lolos juga cuma IELTS-nya belum mencukupi sih jadi siapa yang IELTS-nya? Yang tiga tiga yang lolos tahun ini di Southern Cross. Oh ada tiga lah. Southern hmm, Cross ya. Iya. Oh. Iya. Yeah. Yeah. Australian Award. Iya. Yeah. Iya. Yeah. Kita masih punya sekitar tiga menit lagi untuk dua speaker yang sisa sebelum semua peserta, semua peserta lagi di waiting list. Jadi kita masih menunggu speaker masuk dulu baru um, pertanyaan di admit. Assalamualaikum Pak Sekretaris Senat. Waalaikumsalam Pak Rambat. Ibu Os Dr. Wilde. Selamat sore. Pak Udin sudah bergabung berpartisipasi dalam webinar. Selamat datang Pak. Terima kasih Ibu. Iya. Ini dari rumah ya Pak? Iya. Soalnya di ruang Senat tadi putus supaya rampat. 
Belum oh. sama akhirnya saya ingin kata senat pulang. Iya, <laughs> tadi mati, mati lampu itu Prof. ada tumbang pohon di rumah tiga. Makanya Ayo. saya telepon ke lain cepat supaya... Iya, terpaksa. Iya, makasih. Mudah-mudahan besok karena dosa mau rapat senat itu. Insya Allah, insya Allah. Saya ada masalah lagi. Terpaksa pulang di rumah aja. Oh, ini mulai jadi rumah. Di sini sudah ada Pak eh, Pak Sekretaris Senat ada Pak Rektor, Power 4, ada uh, pembicara Ibu Tuti Rahayu sama Ibu Nindia dari AAS, Australia World Scholarship, Ibu Endang yang sementara studi Pak di studi S3 di Australia, dosen kita dari Fakultas Perikanan. Ada Prof. Loli juga yang kemarin melakukan kuliah umum di Charles Darwin University. Sebagai info saja. Makasih. Ya. Sorry, Pak Rektor. Kayaknya headsetnya lagi dilepas, Pak. Oh iya. <laughs> Siapa tadi pintu lima? Siapa? Ada tadi cowok yang keluar yang ini. Siapa? Oh dari humas pak? Bukan 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 yang pakai yang pakai masker. Di mana ya pak? Ini dia yang pakai masker ini siapa ini? Oh yang di sini. <laughs> <laughs> Aduh pak ini. Aduh. Oh ya, mari kita pasti ketahui. <laughs> <laughs> itu salah satu dosen FC Pak. Oh salah satu dosen FC Pak. Iya. Selamat datang Pak David. Pak David itu lima. Selamat sore Pak. Pak. Rektor selamat sore. Selamat sore Budin. Ya. Hey. Sore Pak Udin. Selamat sore pada. Iya pada. Dampingi. Kawal terus, Pak. Kalau gitu, ya. Kawal mesti. Itu penting. Hujan-hujan begini, kawal. Tadi bendera tuh, bendera tuh sering kenal karena pakai masker. Aku setelah begini, paling cepat. Pelan. Bandwidth-nya low. Ya, Masih sudah. 
Kenapa? Hmm, di mana jadi? Nah, iya.
Bill. Simon dari CDU bisa masuk. Bill, Ma. Simon. Halo. Good afternoon. Dr. Simon. How are you? Ya. Yeah. Can you hear me there? Is that okay? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, we are now with our rector, Prof. MJ Sapteno. Maybe you can say, you want to say hi. Yes, well, MJ hello. Sapteno, yes. And That's also our vice president for, yeah. Our speaker, Ibu Tutik. And also some participants. How are you, Simon? I'm I'm very good. Uh, no, I'm really looking forward to uh, this presentation and to okay. meet everyone as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for uh, joining us for our webinar. Of course. <laughs> we still wait for Amanda. We have uh, about four minutes before we start. Right. Hopefully, Amanda will get in at the time. Last year, we visited uh, Charles Darwin University with uh, Professor Aholia Wadloli. He, oh. yes, he delivered a public lecture in the uh, Faculty of uh, Humanities, if I don't mistake, with uh, yes. Vanessa. Vanessa. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Vanessa. yeah. Yes, we call that the, the, the College of Indigenous futures and arts and society. So yes, I, I remember that. Yeah. You, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, uh, he, uh, he is here as well because uh, our rector sent him to give a public lecture on oh. October. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I am, Master. I am. Good afternoon, Master Simon. Nice to meet you, nice to see you. Yes. <laughs> Did you enjoy Darwin? Hello? Oh, and yeah, I was just wondering whether you all enjoyed Darwin when you visited. Yeah. Pak, <laughs> menikmati Darwin gak, Pak? Very nice. It's very nice. <laughs>
Wilma ber-13 yang bergabung. Banyak di waiting list, Pak. Cuma kita ada di waiting list. Masuk dulu, Pak. Baru ada 3 orang di waiting list. Lima semua. Ya. Oh, ya. Per satu tidak masuk. Kalau matikan anus ada mana? Ilma, propam anda semua masuk. Hello, Aman. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Very well. Good afternoon, Prof. Amanda. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Okay. It's very cold here. <laughs> thank you. Now we we with our rector, Prof. Nus Sapteno. Hello, Nus Sapteno. Hello, Amanda. <laughs> how are you? Good. Bye. <laughs> Bye, yeah. <laughs> Hai hey, Yus. Hai. Did you hear me? Ya. Yeah. Hai Mandy. Hai hey, Yus, how are you? Apa kabar? Baik, hai. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. Been a long time. Too long. <laughs> It seems we now have 50 participants. Uh, According to the time, we should uh, start now. Shall we start now? Okay. Pak Rektor, Pak, kami mulai ya, Pak. Yeah. Izin, Pak. Iya. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for finding time to participate on International Office Patimura University webinar series. My name is Will Malatuni, Head of International Office of Patimura University. The Honorable Rector of Patimura University, Vice Rectors of Patimura University, the Head and Secretary of Patimura University Senate, our speakers, Professor Dr. Simon Moss from Charles Darwin University, Australia, Professor Amanda Reichelt-Brasset from Southern Cross University, Australia, 
Mrs. Tuti Krahayu and Mrs. Dwiya Anindya Sita from Australia Awards in Indonesia, all guests of this online seminar today. Welcome to the webinar series of Patimura University Australia Station, The Way to Study Overseas, Writing Research Grant Proposal and Pursuing PhD Degree. We have a scheduled program on the screen. I will start the screen. Okay, yes. Sorry, takes time. Yeah, hopefully it's display on your screen. So we start with welcoming speech by moderator, opening speech by rector of Patimura University, and we will have three presentation by three speakers, and every speakers will have a question and answer session per presentation, and we have uh, three minutes. Uh, testimony by Endang Jamal, who is a PhD candidate, Southern Cross University, and also lecturer of UNPATI. And we have also closing statement by speakers, photo session, and closing speech by rector of Patimura University. Okay. We start now with the opening speech by Rector of Patimura University, Professor Dr. M.J. Sarteno, SHM Hum. Please, the time is yours. Thank you, Wilma. As a moderator. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our online seminar with the title, The Way to Study Overseas writing research grant proposal and pursuing PhD degree. Honorable Vice Rector of Patimuya University, the Head and Secretary of Patimura University Senate, our speaker, Professor Dr. Simon Moss from Charles Darwin University, Australia, Professor Amanda Rachel Bress from Southern Cross University, Australia, Mrs. Tutit Rahayu and Mrs. Dwia Anindya Chita from Australia Award, Indonesia. All guests of this online seminar, peace to all of us. I would like to say thank you to the head of staff International Office of Patimura University who has arranged this meeting, I must stay, say to this online seminar, it's very important and should be had regu regularly in order to extend our knowledge, either from academic of Patimura University or other in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, Patimura University is higher education institution that holds edu education, research, and community service activity is as its main text. I should be recognized that Patimura University in carrying out its debt that the of uh, responsibility as a higher education institution has weakness and face many challenges internally and externally. Internally, the skill of patrimony human resources as the main proponent need to be improved, especially in the field of research so that they can compete nationally or internationally. Besides that, the infrastructures such as labs are still inadequate so that need to be fixed in the future. 
Externally, the cooperation that has been made under memorandum of understanding with the universities in Asia, Australia, Europe, and America are not implemented in a good way because of many obstacles such as financial problems, the basis of research resources, and one of the main issue here is the awareness that is not yet being established in order to implement joint research regularly or continually. Ladies and gentlemen, another challenge that we face in the desire and seriousness of Patimura University's researchers to produce a research proposal in relation with the actual interesting issue to compete nationally and internationally. Only some researchers and groups are regularly from year to year produce the research proposal and are success in national competition, while the other have not made a breakthrough to compete openly. The point here is that the research has not become a need of obligation for the scientists. Once again, there is not good awareness to make research as much to compete according to their respective competence, competency. As a leader to keep, give direction and motivation to build desire and awareness to research, to do research that has good quality, nationality, nationality or internationality. Ladies and gentlemen, in relation to be afford to get foreign scholarship for lecture and student, the challenge that we face is the mastery of English language. There was Rhode Pusat Bahasa, Patimur University, we has made English language course program for lecture and students. Furthermore, the process and test material needs extra attention from the lectures and students, which means that they must prepare themselves as a good a possible. As other words, it requires good preparation and a strong will to go to studying abroad according to their respective fields. Ladies and gentlemen, according to its agenda, I hope today online seminar will run smooth, smoothly and continuously so that giving much benefit to all, to all of us. Once again, I would like to say thank you to our speakers, Professor Dr. Simon Moss, Professor Amanda Rachel Brasset, Master Tuti Rahayu, who has been willing to participate in this online seminar, be giving for important and beneficial material for us. I also would like to say thank you to the participants who attend this online seminar. God bless us. Finally, by saying thanks to the Almighty God, I officially open this on online seminar. Thank you and peace to us. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Prof. Sapteno. Now we turn to the presentation session.
But before we start, uh, let me explain how you can talk to us during the webinar. If you have any question during the presentation, just write them to chat room. Please put your name followed by your institution so it is easy for us to recognize your question. We will try to discuss your question during the time duration available for each speaker. Now we have Professor Reichelt Brasset, sorry, <laughs> will deliver a talk about how to write collaborative successful research grant. But beforehand, I will read her short biography for your information, please. Um, yeah, Professor Amanda Reichelt Brasset has a Bachelor of Applied Science in Coastal Management from the University of New England, Northern Rivers, a Master of Science in Marine Chemistry from James Cook University, North Queensland, and a PhD in Marine Ecotoxicology from Southern Cross University. Sorry. Amanda is a senior lecturer and has published in many scientific journals and presented her research findings at national and international conferences and co-author of a book chapter. To Prof. Amanda, the time is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, Wilma. And um, I'll just have to update you. There must be somewhere on the internet that says I'm a senior lecturer, but earlier this year, I made um, full professor and I had my interview during the earthquake in Andon. <laughs> um, so I have very good memories of my interview, but um, some very interesting memories of Andon at that time too. So um, thank you for having me. And it's really great to see some familiar faces out there in the audience. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this is all going to work. Um, is everybody seeing my screen okay, Wilma? Is that, is that good? Yes? Excellent. So um, Wilma invited me to give this presentation and um, she asked me to talk about writing research grants, but um, one of the words that I think was very important in the invitation that she gave me is actually mental. Um, successful. So we all can write research grants, but the trick to writing a successful research grant um, well, there's many tricks, but there's also some luck. So today, what I'd like to talk to you about is just some of the things you need to think about when you're putting your grant together, and particularly when you're working with a team. And I expect you'll be looking at international teams and collaborations with people from different countries, but also teams within your country and teams within the University of Tatanua even. So why bother? Why bother? Why would we write a grant application? Well, first of all, it doesn't cost any money to submit a grant application. And in fact, you've got nothing to lose and a whole lot to gain because it can give you funding that is research enabling. And what that does is help to create an upward spiral for your research success. You will draw upon your students, um, and you can bring your students along in the pathway as well. So really the first big successful grant is always the hardest to get. So you can sometimes be inspired by those smaller community grants or you might have internal research grants that help you, that you are required to write a proposal for and get practice. Make sure you apply for those because they give you the practice that helps enable you to get the skills to write a bigger grant. Mm -hmm. Once you get one big one, you start getting your track record and things become easier and you end up establishing yourself as a successful researcher. And importantly, 
a researcher who gets a grant and produces outputs from that grant. If you only get a grant once and don't produce any results, well, you're going to not have those gold stars to your name to keep getting successful grants. But we do have challenges. And one of them in a world like today is that we all feel very overcommitted and we always say yes to doing lots of things and helping people out and um, looking after our families and looking after our um, jobs and our students. Um, but sometimes you have to learn to say no to some things. Sometimes you need to make sure you've achieved something in the task that you've said yes to before you take on another task that you're saying yes to. And um, it's important to develop a network of senior peers and trust them and um, create that game plan that you can stick to. Another way to manage that time and overcommitment is when you're talking about being a collaborator in a grant, create a team where you meet on a regular basis and you have a task to do before you meet again. So that means that everybody's making progress in the team, the collaborative team, to um, on the grants to make sure it's submitted. So meet regularly with your collaborators. Another one is that we start writing too late and it takes time and effort to put a very good grant together. And it might be too late in terms of the process of applying, but it might be that you leave grant writing till you've finished everything else in the day. But keep in mind that most people are more alert and they think better and they're more creative in the morning and not so much in the evening. We all get a little bit tired. So you're often the best time to work is in the morning. So maybe you can prioritize some of your time for grant writing in the time that you are freshest and most alert, most creative. And then there's another one that is making excuses. It's like, oh, my collar's too tight. Oh, I'm going to tidy up my office. I'm going to organize my filing system. And there's always something better to do or easier to do than write the grants. So you put it off and you it ends up um, unachievable because you create a little busy life for yourself around things that you think you need to do. So I say, use the Nike mantra, just do it. And even when I was writing my PhD, I used to have a little note on my desk and it just said, a PhD only gets done by doing it. So a grant will only get written by writing it. <laughs> so you've got to maintain that motivation. <clears throat> So I know this presentation is a little bit of a focus on the Australia Award, Awards and um, applying for PhDs and having your grant application ready in your Australia Awards application. And this is a wonderful forum for you to connect with um, me and through me staff at Southern Cross University and I'm sure through um, Simon staff at Charles Sturt University to help connect you with a potential supervisor in your interest study area. Because once you identify a supervisor and you start having a conversation with them, um, you can work with them as part of your team to help develop your grant idea or your PhD project idea or your application idea. You need to, it's really helpful to work with to potential supervisors in this context because you need to make sure that the institution that you're going to has the equipment and the facilities for you to do the project that you want to do. So it's no use coming to an institution in Australia that you are expected to do all this scanning, electron microscopy, if the equipment isn't, isn't available at that institution. So it's really good to establish some communication with a potential supervisor. And that might mean you have to persist with emails a little bit. You have to identify to them that you are planning on applying for an Australia Award 
we get many applications for PhD students to come and join us all the time. But because you're showing the initiative that you're seeking your own funding, you'll often get the support. So be a little bit persistent. They all want to see that you can write in English because they want to have students that can write in English. So your communication with them will be a really good checkpoint for them to think, I want to endorse a student. I want this student to be on my team and I want to commit my time and effort into um, supporting this student and to graduation of a PhD. So I think after today, I think both Simon and I, emails are available. And I think if you've got people at other universities, make sure you make those connections. So you must start, don't wait till the week before the grant is due to start. Start well ahead of time. One step you can do is read the guidelines first because every grant has a different set of guidelines, a different set of criteria, and your project will need to be massaged or need to be developed to work within those guidelines of a grant. Mm -hmm. Make sure you draw upon collaborators and you discuss and who will take on what responsibility in the context of that grant writing and who will lead that grant. You actually need a champion who's going to motivate everybody else to, to write the grant or their sections of the grant and put it together. People should not be expected to have their name put on a grant if they're not going to do any work to contribute. So think of it is, is that you're a team from the time the grant is starting to be written. It's also a good idea to get internal reviewers or people that you can look over your work. So line up some people early on to say, um, to get them to, I'm planning to in three weeks time to have my grant application ready. Would you be available then for me to review it? So line those people up early. Um, make sure your budget is absolutely perfect. If your numbers don't add up, um, it can be a big negative to the scoring system. And all importantly, you need to check on your internal sign off dates. So if Pano needs to sign off on the grant application, you may need to make sure you give him time to, for all the administration to happen internally. Um, and so what am I going to write my grant on? Well, some grants are really focused on, on different topics, but other ones, they give you a lot of freedom to be creative and innovative and have new ideas, particularly in the sciences and the social science. But if you're going to be part of a grant, it takes a lot of time and effort if you're successful. So make sure you're passionate and you love that topic. Don't go along with it with your tail dragging because you're going to have to engage with your successful and, and love what you're doing. Make sure what you're claiming you're going to do is actually achievable in a time frame. Don't promise the world and only be able to deliver um, Ambon Island in Indonesia. <laughs> Make sure you've got targets that are achiev achievable. Um, and consider what publications that would come out of that grant. So think about how you would structure your research to maximize the number of publications that you could produce or to create some really powerful publications as well. So think about that endpoint and you draw that into the grant where you'll be publishing in high impact journals and or you will be disseminating all your findings so that they're more available to the public and to people to build upon in terms of research knowledge. So think about that process too. <clears throat> so I found this meme, in the magical world of grant writing, minutes feel like days and days feel like minutes. It really depends on what part of the grant writing process you're in. So at the beginning, minutes will feel like days, but at the end, when you've only got a couple of days left, will be rushing and um, feeling like you don't have enough time to go. 
make sure you understand your topic area really well. Your background and your um, how you pitch the problem will be really important for you to know the literature that is surrounding that topic. So you need to read and you need to put what you want to do in context. Make good plans. Make sure you're producing um, methodology that's going to be giving you quality sides or quality results. And think about the ethics, right? Human, like it, particularly if you're going to study in Australia, we have human ethics committees and we have animal ethics committees. And if you want to work with anything that's got a vertebrate, you have to go through the process of the ethics committee approval. And it's all about managing harm to animals. And with humans, it's really a hard, much harder process to get approval for working with children, for example, um, or working with Indigenous communities. There's different approval processes. So you could work on an invertebrate space, species and not have to worry about any of that. But if you want to go and work on whales and dolphins, for sure, you have to think about those approval processes. Um, try and have a focused testable hypothesis, which is novel and new and a little bit exciting, broadly interesting, because your reviewers are not all going to be in the expert area that you're in. Use every opportunity you can to demonstrate that you're very passionate and you care about the work you do. It doesn't mean you have to show emotive writing, but you can show very careful consideration about the topic as well. When you draw upon collaborators, make sure that they have a contribution to make which is unique to the team. It's no use having five geochemists on a project if they can't offer something uniquely different from each other. So, and sometimes these days, it's really good to draw upon teams that include um, environmental scientists, for example, along with social scientists, where you're working on social, cultural and environmental problems and you've got expertise that surrounds those broader problems as well. That's an example, but I'm sure you can think about many ways those diverse skills can bring, bring a new level of novelty or the team that you make can bring a new level of novelty to a research area. Titles are really important. It's the first thing you read, the reviewer reads, so make sure it's not wordy and verbose and make sure it gets to the point. Don't be too shy about it. Make it look like you're doing something exciting. Make it relatively broad. And a short number of words is really important to capture um, the audience or capture the reviewer's attention. You don't have to have your title worked out to begin with. Your title might be one of the last things that is finessed um, and, and fine-tuned before you submit. Your introduction is really important to set the scene and provide a snapshot of the study. So write a really clear introduction using references that defines the problem that your work is going to address explain why the topic is important to society and the community and maybe to particular groups of people. Um, but a way to do that is work through the literature and say, you know, we understand this, we understand that, we understand that, but we don't really know about this. So you identify the gap in knowledge and you go, what my project is going to do is going to help fill that gap in knowledge by doing this, this and this. So you're actually identifying how your study is going to enhance the knowledge in that field of study. And obviously that leads to a very clear aim. So you have a nice, strong, clear aim. And your methods are really important. Um, I think Indonesia in general has to work strongly on their experimental design, their methodology, their replication, understanding the difference between pseudo replication and replication. Um, 
be brief, but explain clearly the number of replicates, the number of samples, how many sites, for example, or ha um, how many tests, and make it doable and achievable. Because when you have a good replication in a study, you are limited to what you can do because it can expand very quickly based on that level of replication. But it's better to have a tight study that's very well replicated that you can publish than a very big study which is a very thin veneer of trying to trying to find out about something. So really consider the methodology, not only the tools that you'll be using, but the statistically rigorous approach that you'll be using. And like I mentioned before, your budget has to be correct to the final dollar. And if a grant that you're applying for is in 20, you know, $20,000 grant or $2 million, billion rupiah, you can never go over that, even by, even by $1. And, and this might be more of an Australian thing, but um, yeah, you can, if you ask for more than what is on offer, then they'll think, oh, the study can't be done because they've asked for more than what you've got on offer. Um, sometimes you can explain how much in-kind contribution, and this is important in our big grantee systems in Australia, but how much you can offer in terms of your time, other people's time, in terms of the resources that already exist, um, in terms of travel and transport and using vehicles, sometimes that's really important to sort of capture um, the amount of contribution that you can make to the grant success being done. I'm sorry, I'm going on this backwards, but <laughs> I think you'll get the idea. Um, with, with the grant, don't um, scrimp to the point where you can't do the job that you've said you're going to do. And we have a funny thing in Australia where you apply for $200,000, for example, and the funding body, if you're lucky, turns around and gives you $160,000. And then you have to look and see if you can do that project or you need to modify it a little bit. And then you have to send them a letter to say, I need to modify this a little bit based on the reduced amount of funding I received. Or you think, okay, ask somebody to top it up um, to university or something like that. But it's a fickle little game and you really do have to be careful that you've got the resources to do the job that you said you're going to do. So make time for internal review. This is another funny meme. And I'm sure we've all done something like this in even in our undergraduate days or, or whatever, but we've submitted our report and we find a typo on the first page um, too late can't do anything about it. But um, an internal review can really help pick out those silly little errors and typos that you, because you've worked on something so much, you don't see them anymore. You gloss over it. You, you, you can't see it. For the, we can't see the forest for the trees. So that ex internal review is really, really important. So some generalizations about writing. Generally, it's easier to write in the past tense. Oh, sorry, that's when you're writing a paper. <laughs> so generally, you'll be writing in the future tense. Sorry, future tense. So you will do this and you will do that. Once you're writing the paper, then you're saying, I have done this and I have done that. Sorry. Um, really comes concentrate on grammar. Um, you can generally work in the third person, but it's not a rule. More and more often grants are being written in the first person. We will do this and we will do this. So keep that in mind. It's like you can write from the first person. It's okay. Write to your target audience. So who are you trying to impress? If it's a grant for community groups, you really want to write to an audience which is sympathetic with community groups and not high-level scientists, right? Um, 
grants do well when they have figures in tables and particularly when you have word limits in grants, you can say a whole lot in a figure or a table rather than just having like pages and pages of words. So make sure you think about creatively putting data together or summarising literature together that makes a statement that tells a lot in a small amount of words. And then you must talk to those tables in the text. So, I'm trying to fit into my 15 minutes. I haven't got a clock, so I'm not sure where I'm at. But um, are we going all right, Wilma? Is it okay timing? Yeah. So let's all imagine that we've all been writing a grant and we've got to the point where we think we've finished and we're going to submit it. And we do. We put it in and all the boxes are ticked and everybody's signed off and you're really happy and excited and you know, you've got some time to wait. So what do you do next? Just have a moment there and think what you would do next. Probably go to have a rest. <laughs> Lie on the beach somewhere. Enjoy the sunset. Or maybe you could start your next research grant. <laughs> or maybe you could start your next research project. Or maybe there's a paper that's sitting there that needs a bit of work before you submit it. But my recommendation is to take a little bit of time to relax. But also remember that you don't stop just because you've submitted the grant. It's not like that's all you have to do. It's like there's other things in the background that are going to help you be a successful researcher and then help. Um, you have a better chance. So finally, the time goes by and you're finding out and the date comes and it's like, am I successful? And it's like, wow, hooray. And for some grants, the success rate is 10%. So if you're not successful, you're in with 90% of the people who are applying, right? But some grants, if you are successful, it's the start of a very big project, okay? So this makes you have to realise there's a lot of work to do now that I've been successful. It's not the end, it's just the beginning, okay? <laughs> and if you haven't been successful, well, there's many ways to think positively about that as well, okay? So there's lots of very, very good applications that don't get funded. So it doesn't mean you're a failure. It means you need to learn from that. You need to accept it. You will get reviewers' feedback, and that feedback is something that you can use to improve your application and make it better for the next time and plan to resubmit it. When you've got a grant that's written, you, um, you can change it or, or shift it slightly and submit it again another year. Um, and consider the feedback that you get that is also good. Like a lot of reviewers will provide you with positive feedback. And it's good for your emotion to read that and value that positive feedback that you get. So just remember, many grants are 10% success rate. Some are 20%, but still only one in five. So it's a competitive, it's a very competitive um, game. Um, and you really have to be in it to win it. If you're not in it, you can never be successful. So get with a great team of collaborators and work hard to put in a quality application. And just remember too, when I say you can be writing papers, the stronger your research track record is, the more recognised you're going to be in the grant application. So it's like a cycle. So if you haven't got your grant application, work on that paper or work on other outputs that are going to make you more competitive for those grants in the future. So I'm going to pause and leave 
um, hand over to you, Wilma, for maybe if there's any questions. Sorry, Amanda, could you say again? Uh, it's, yeah. um, I've just sort of finished. This is the beach near where I live. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Where, where is this? Uh, <laughs> this? In Bali? Or? No, no, this is in Byron Bay in Australia, the very far okay. east point of Australia. So okay. um, beautiful water, but a bit cold at the moment. <laughs> so I just uh, will make if there's any questions. Okay, have. yeah. Thank you, Prof. Mandy, if I allow to call you. So maybe we we will have a discuss for question and answer. So uh, let me have a look on the chat room. Probably somebody would like to ask question. Are there any participants who would like to ask a question? Only say hi. Thanks for organizing. You're welcome. It seems uh, no question Everyone's for first, shy. but I have I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, because uh, I I'm interested with your uh, with your quote. Most grants have a word limit. So most grants have a word limit means that the more you want to gather the grants, the limited of a word that you need to use on your proposal. Is that correct if I don't mistake? So how many pages uh, better for the proposal should we submit it for uh, grants, do you think? I think um, the different grants will tell you what mm -hmm. the word limit is. Okay. So depending on the grant okay. and um, in Australia, a lot of grants, if, if you go over the word limit, because it's electronic, you can't go over the word limit. So that you can't submit it if you go over the word limit. But um, the word limits are very strict. So it's about writing in a very concise and clear way and getting the point across. And not rambling around the edges, blah, 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 because you can imagine that if a reviewer is reviewing the grant, they might have 200 to review. So they want to see an application that's clear, to the point, succinct, know what they're talking about. The, the applicants know what they're talking about. They know what they want. They know what they can do. And they're very clear about it. And if you can be, cons that's why they have those word limits because they don't want you to ramble on. <laughs> okay. And uh, do you think how many minimum words that we need to use for submission, the grant? Um, well, <laughs> I've, never thought, words. I've never thought about a minimum, yeah, yes. but I think, mm -hmm. I think you have to... I think if you have very few words, like I would be working close to the word limit within a few hundred words of the word limit. If you have less than that, I think you're probably missing something important in the way that you're writing. If you, if you are asked to write a page and you only make a small paragraph, you're not going to have the detail that is expected of you when you write the grant. No more questions. Sorry, it seems like uh, somebody not unmute. unmute uh, Maria, Maria, I think. So we have a question from Devalina. Is it possible to write collaborative research with students from Australia through cooperation with students from Unpati? Hmm? Yeah. We have a question from Devalina Lanit. 
of Valley, is it possible to write collaborative research with students from Australia through cooperation with students from UNPATI? Yeah, um, we don't really have a funding set up for students um, at the moment, but it's a good exercise to have students practicing grant writing. So maybe when we do some of the new Colombo plan, that could be something that we could incorporate into the program when we have our students come and visit Un Patty. We could set up something within that that framework, but I don't think there's and, and so that anything's possible. It just depends if somebody's got some money to throw at it. So, but um, I think um, you could also ask the same question about staff from universities in Australia and staff from the University at Unpaddy. And there's some opportunities through Australia Awards programs and the alumni programs with Australia Awards. But there isn't a lot unless um, there's a really, like a lot of our grants, we can include international collaborators, but those international collaborators have to bring something unique and very special into the mix as well. Maybe I have to. Okay. Uh, and the other question is, what is the biggest obstacle is that the proposal is not accepted? Mm, um, I don't think there's any one answer to that. I think um, not novelty and a doable project are important, but I just like, I think there is a lot of projects that are worthy of funding that just miss out. And I, it's, um, doesn't mean it's not a good project. It just means that somebody had a slightly different priority at the time. So I think it's not one obstacle. I don't think there's one big elephant in the room about not getting funded. But I think quality, quality application is probably something that is a really important aspect of success. Yes, yes, but uh, somebody want to ask question? Who? Uh, but we, we still have one question before I go. Uh, this is from Tual, so Tual High School of Economics. How is the strategy of writing scientific paper to break into international journal, Prof. Amanda? What do you think? Um, I would think if you're well, even thinking about writing a scientific or a journal paper at the moment and you're in high school, I think you're highly motivated and I love that question coming from a high school student. <laughs> it's wonderful to see that someone is excited to be doing that in high school. And I think um, the first one, like first become successful in writing journal articles in Bahasa Indonesia language. I mean, that whole process of, of journal submission and everything is good to understand. International journals are obviously in English language. So I really think collaborations are valuable. So connecting with people who are native English speakers and finding a project that is mutually interesting and mutually beneficial and then working and committing to working with that person or people to write the journal article and give you confidence in the writing in English and everything to move to a next, next one and a next one. And then, you know, eventually you will have the confidence and the capabilities to be writing international journal articles independently. But I think take a stepped approach. Thank you. 
uh, we still have about one minute before we uh, go to another speakers. Probably somebody want to ask directly to Prof. Maybe, Amanda. Maybe I want to ask Amanda. Uh, who is, uh, please uh, introduce thank your name and your institution. Okay, thank you, um, uh, uh, Wilma, as a moderator. Hi, Amanda. Hey, how are you? Thank you. It is, uh, I'm really happy to meet you because uh, maybe this is the second time we met, if I'm not wrong. For the first time. Yeah, I huh? And uh, I see an international small island conference. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, what I want to. Uh, ask here is uh, maybe uh, the fact is uh, it is it is not easy to make a quality proposal in order to receive grant from overseas unit, uh, institution and I have tried several times despite having received a grant but I think it's still difficult uh, because it uh, will be faced with uh, what is the large target I mean uh, the goal of the do donor or the institute, institution target. And moreover, donor from a uh, university. It is very difficult. I tried so many times. Uh, apart from that, it is really needed. And what I want to uh, ask you, or my question is, uh, if uh, we try and try and make, a, uh, already make a good uh, or uh, best quality proposal, and still uh, rejected from the, uh, the grant, what should we do? I mean, you, uh, you, 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 you uh, doing or present everything with a good uh, way, but uh, it's still not work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, maybe there's a couple of things to think about. And one might be, maybe you need to get a collaborative team or a very senior person to help lead the grant. Um, they say in Australia, this is like hopping on someone or, or jumping on someone's coattails. If you think someone has a big coat or a cape and jump on their coattails and they're going forward very fast, but it's like you, you work with them and you use their influence to help you step up a bit. That's a way that has worked in the past. Maybe you think your proposal's amazing and going to solve the problems of the world, but somewhere along the line, it's not the priority for those grants at the time. I don't know what you're researching on, but maybe you maybe need to think about what are the priority areas. Sometimes grant applications highlight priority <laughs> areas and really target those. Yeah. Um, but of course, researchers think their work is the most important in the world. Like we all are very passionate about what we do, but we also have to think about what is important for today and what is the priority areas of those grants. And it might be that your research can fit into it as a smaller part of something that's got some momentum in that research area. So maybe step back from your grant and look <laughs> out at what are really important pressing issues that your skills could be applied to. And then think about who it would be a team that you could surround yourself with and work on pinpointing a good application to deal with one of those issues. Yes, I don't have the answers, but there are a few <laughs> so, I try. I try already that I, and I approve uh, my proposal already uh, for the next year, but still the same. But in other case, I uh, enter or I submit that proposal in other, other institutions or other grant. And they escaped my that, that uh, grant. I, I feel that this is really ridiculous. 
that's uh, <laughs> yeah maybe uh, so pr probably uh, you will you will uh, have a correspondence letter with Amanda more uh, closely uh, because we are uh, limited on the time uh, uh, I want to go to Prof Simon but I still have one interesting question from uh, sorry Ibu Renata Nihulu because he want to conduct a PhD uh, degree. So how would you explain that a little is too short specific for a PhD proposal? Let me say that I want to conduct a study in specific context of teachers education in Maluku. Is it too specific for a PhD title proposal, uh, Prof. Amanda? Um, I think that is a really good topic, but what you would probably for a PhD, you probably want some comparative context. So in Maluku compared to Australia, for example, so if you're applying for an Australia award, you can do some of your research in Indonesia. And if you're in Australia, you can also do some of your research in Australia. And then you've got this really interesting international comparative assessment that not many people can do because they don't have access to the time and the resources to do that. So it's an interesting question, but how about a comparative assessment for different situations? Like you could compare private school versus public school, or you could compare um, the Indonesia education system with Australian education system, or just think about that question, but use some comparative assessment. Okay, uh, I think that uh, we already answer our question. If it's uh, uh, no question anymore, Prof. Mendy, thank you very much. Uh, we will back to you after uh, for a closing statement, and we will turn now to uh, Prof. Simon Moss for uh, the thank second you. speaker. I'll thank you, thank you, I'll Prof. Mendy. Yes. Uh, now we, we begin to give a uh, time to speaker two, Professor Dr. Simon Moss, Dean of Graduate Study, uh, Charles Darwin University. Uh, firstly, I will present his biography. So, Prof. Uh, Simon Moss. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Simon Moss is a professor. Dr. Simon Moss is a senior lecturer in psychology. His primary research interest concerns how characteristics of organization and societies and to ethics to gain a deeper understanding of the issue faced by higher degree students who committed year of their lives to attain their postgraduate qualifications. Dr. Professor Dr. Simon Moss is making time to work in the SUS of Charles Darwin University PhD candidates by living as closely as possible to help them achieve their dreams. So uh, to Professor Moss, he will deliver the topic about higher degree by research study at Charles Darwin University. To Professor Moss, the time is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilma. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit about how to enroll in a PhD in Australia, as well as how to complete a PhD in Australia. And in particular, I'll answer four questions, which is who, how, what, and where, that is who can enroll, um, how to enroll and how to choose a supervisor, what can you study and where can you study? But I'll focus not on information that you can easily find on the internet, but instead present information that you can't find it's sort of the truth that no one writes about. So I'll focus on that sort of information. So firstly, who is eligible to study a PhD in Australia? Who will be accepted? Well, that's reasonably simple. The answer is basically that in Australian universities, anyone who's completed about six months of research at a sort of something like a postgraduate level is likely to be eligible. So that could be like a, a small thesis in a, in a master's course, or it might even be sort of some work 
uh, research as part of your work that you've published, but if it's equivalent to about at least six months of completed research at that sort of postgraduate level, even if it wasn't completed at a university, you're likely to be accepted. Now, when I say research, of course, I mean scholarly research. So for example, you know, researching the internet to buy the best shoes is obviously not real research. Um, but in addition to completing six months of research, Australian universities tend to prefer people who like to question the existing practices. They like to challenge the existing beliefs and assumptions of people to improve society. They actually want people who will even question the supervisors and lecturers rather than just accept and agree with what the experts are saying. Okay, so that's basically who they want, someone who's completed some research and will question assumptions. So how do you enrol? How do you choose a supervisor and university and so forth? And Amanda talked a little bit about this topic, but I, I want to sort of reiterate some of what she said. So it's usually very easy to find possible supervisors. Very easy, you can just, you know, uh, visit the website of most universities, and then you can easily search supervisors, that's easy. So for example, you know, if you wanted to search supervisors at CDU, you would just Google CDU, that's the university, research portal is what it's called, and that'll take you to a website and you can easily search supervisors. That's the easy part. The hard part is to decide which of these supervisors you would like to choose. Because many people, unfortunately, are disappointed with their supervisors. It's one of the great disappointments in life. So how do you identify the right supervisor? Well, actually, I think one way is to, to write to them and to test them. You can actually find ways of testing them. So what do you write and how does that work? So I'll give you an example of what to write. In fact, I've written something in the, uh, the chat now. So it's, I've just, it's a sort of like, some typical sentences you might include if you wanted to write to a supervisor. And there's a particular reason for these sentences. So you, you know, you'd introduce your name, and you know, my name is such and such. I'm working at, you know, you'd mention the university and potty. You'd send talk about your interest. You might say I'm interested in a PhD in a particular field. That's all fine. And then you might say what you're fascinated by, particularly fascinated by, you know, a particular issue and you want to learn more about something else. And then you'd finish saying, look, look, I appreciate that you might be very busy, but I was wondering whether you'd be interested in the possibility of supervising me. And if not, would you suggest someone else I could contact? Now, there's a reason why you're writing these particular sentences. Firstly, you want to assess whether or not the supervisor is humble, that they admit that they're not good at everything. You'd want a supervisor who might say, look, you know, I have an interest and in experience in this topic, but, you know, we might need some assistance on this other aspect. You know, that you want someone who admits their faults, admits their limitations, because they're people who are much more likely to be supportive and open to your ideas. And they've been shown to be more effective supervisors. Secondly, you'd like a supervisor who doesn't seem too rushed and responds quite promptly. You don't want someone who, for example, only writes a very brief email, maybe just a few words, and is delayed in their response. Because these are obviously often individuals who put too much pressure on themselves and are not really willing to, to listen to you and to embrace your ideas. And thirdly, you want someone who shows they're sensitive, they've changed their response to suit your needs. They've listened to what you have said. You don't want someone who sort of pressures you into a particular approach or methodology but is sensitive and can accommodate you and that'll make you feel better about your work and research. But then how do you choose a university? Which universities, for example, in Australia, if you wanted to work in Australia, should you choose? Well, to be honest, now I'd be interested in Amanda's view too, but actually it doesn't really matter that much. Um, most of the universities in Australia are quite similar. There, there are some universities that are very prestigious and they can have some great researchers, but sometimes they're very large universities and you might not feel quite supported. Uh, 
there are other universities that are very smaller um, where you might feel a bit more supported or sometimes you can feel a bit isolated so every university will provide some benefits and will provide some drawbacks and indeed you don't always even have to live in the same city or state as that university um, in some universities you know you can live away from the main campus so there is quite a lot of choice nevertheless there are some uh, issues you might want to consider so for example some people will actually look at the the annual report the um the report about the university to identify whether or not the university is doing well whether the, the revenue the money they're making and the expenses are quite consistent across time because they don't want a university that's struggling too much where everyone is too busy but the truth is at the moment at least with the next couple of years i think all universities are going to be struggling a little bit it's, a, it's a, obviously a difficult time now both in australia i'm sure in indonesia and around the world for universities so i think many universities will be struggling a little bit so um, you might want to accept some of those difficulties at this time you probably want a university that is in a nice environment there's some evidence that suggests that people actually enjoy their studies more and they're more motivated in an area that is surrounded by nature and trees and the beach or the mountains or something like that although it's not essential of course and you might also want to identify the scholarships that universities offer um, most universities in fact all universities will offer a particular type of scholarship to international candidates called an RTP scholarship. But in some universities, they're very, very competitive. It's very unlikely to receive that scholarship. In other universities, it might not be quite as competitive and you might be more likely to receive that scholarship, you know, even if, you know, if your record is quite good. And then every university will have specific scholarships as well on top of that. Uh, at CDU, we have a scholarship called CDIPS, which is where there's scholarships for people with particular interests that are relevant to the university. And many universities will offer something similar. And also every university has their own culture or brand or style. So for example, at, at CDU, we very much embrace humility, just recognizing that everyone has their strengths, but everyone has their, their limitations and faults. And we really value that equality. And so we really try to treat our candidates as, as equal. So for example, we organize situations in which the candidates, the students, actually use their experience to teach supervisors how to supervise. So they become the teachers, the experts for the day. Um, but of course, other universities will have other brands or styles that you might like. So with all this information though, how do you even reach a decision? There's so much information to think about. How do you decide on the supervisor, the university and the quality and, and the topic? Well, some research indicates that actually the best way to reach a decision is initially, obviously you, you read as much as you can and you might systematically decide you know, which university or supervisor is the best and whatever. But then what you should do is, is leave the decision for a while, maybe a day or two. Don't think about it for a while. Then think about something that makes you feel good, that makes you feel happy. And then in that moment, you often feel a very strong feeling about which university to choose or which supervisor to choose. You have a very strong, what we call like intuition or a hunch or an instinct about what, what feels right. And the research suggests that what feels right to you, particularly when you're feeling quite calm and happy, tends to be the best decision. Um, although it's, it's a controversial issue, but often just your intuition after you feel calm is often better than just sort of weighing the pros and cons or something like that in, in these circumstances. So then how do you actually enroll? Well, that's usually quite straightforward. Most universities, you know, you might look up, um, you know, high degree by research, which is often what we call PhDs and masters by research. Um, and there's usually some fairly clear instruction in how to enroll. The universities want to you enroll, so they'll, they'll help you do that. And normally, you know, you need, do need to 
provide a lot of information, often about your, your, you know, your academic record, of course, um, some personal information, but also probably most importantly, often a, a research proposal, uh, but a much shorter research proposal than what Amanda was talking about for grants, probably only depending on the university, it might be two or three pages that describes what you want to do. And I'll talk a little bit about how to write a good research proposal in a moment. But if you like, we can also, I can also, if you want in the future, present a whole lot of information similar to what Amanda provided on how to write most pers persuasively, how to convince the reader. So for example, some research suggests there are even particular words that you can use, like words like trust and agree, and positive words like that, that have actually been shown to make people trust you more. And so they're more likely to accept what you say. There's other research that shows that certain words actually reduce the likelihood people will believe you. So for example, the word it in English, you know, IT, 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 is actually a, a, a fine word. There's nothing wrong with this word, but it's often quite vague. And people can't quite imagine what you're trying to say just when they see that word. And so trying to avoid that word actually has been shown to increase the likelihood your research proposals are accepted. And if you like, we um, can present a whole lot of other information, little tricks that you can use to convince the university that your topic is, is good and your skills are advanced. Um, so how do you decide you know, what to study? How do you create a unique project? As Amanda said, you really need to create a project that's quite unique and novel and important to you, but how do you identify that project? What are some tricks? So I thought I'd just um, provide you with some advice and tricks that can help you create a unique project. So firstly, you should always consider some, some sort of problem in your life or in society that you'd like to solve, but then imagine the world, maybe 10, 20 years in the future, after these problems have been solved. Because thinking about the future tends to improve your creativity. You should then locate some websites that summarize some of the most interesting discoveries in your area. So you might read websites like, and there are different websites in different languages, but one common website that a lot of scientists use, for example, is called Science Daily. And it'll present some of the latest scientific findings in particular areas. And they can be a really good source of the latest ideas because often when you read research, it's not necessarily the most interesting research. So these websites will often direct you to some of the most exciting research topics that people are, are wanting to pursue. And then I'd recommend you sort of um, skim many articles. So, so read many articles very quickly, maybe 10, 20 articles very, very quickly, and just record some very vague initial thoughts or ideas that pop into your head. Because some research suggests that when you read lots of different ideas very quickly, um, your creativity tends to improve. And then you can repeat this task with more scholarly databases, even something like Google Scholar, uh, where you, you know, look up articles around your interest in Google Scholar, and then rate the relevance of each article that you read. You know, how good is each article on a scale of one to 10? And then maybe read just the five most relevant articles in a lot of depth. Reading just a few articles in depth two times has been shown to also improve the, your likelihood that you'll think of a novel way of con conducting a study. And then you should also possibly try to then examine or identify sets of little ideas that you've collected that are similar to each other. And just that process of trying to identify ideas that are similar to each other, like clusters of similar ideas, has also been shown to improve creativity, as is trying to blend or combine these ideas together. Okay. And finally, you should sometimes even think of the opposite of your idea. So you might have an idea like you want to examine whether or not a particular teaching method is helpful. Think about what would be the opposite of that teaching method? 
you know, and then sort of think about whether that could be useful as well. And just this sort of discipline of thinking in this way has been shown to improve your research ideas. Okay. And then the finally is uh, where should you study? You know, like, and the tr truth is, is that, um, as I mentioned before, in many Australian universities, you can actually study in any city that you like. In fact, in some cases, you might even be able to study at home for at least a year or so. Um, often researchers in Australia quite like um, people, say from Indonesia, conducting some of their study at home and some of the study in Australia. And as Amanda said before, maybe even comparing some of the results across. Partly because you know you have some unique data, as, as Amanda mentioned before, some maybe unique opportunities in Indonesia. But you should definitely be studying in Australia as well to learn you know different ways of undertaking research, different culture, and so forth, which has also been shown to enhance the creativity of your research. So that's about all I wanted to say at this stage. I thought it'd be much more interesting to listen to your questions, and then I can expand on some of these ideas later. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Simon. Uh, we now have one question. So we, we, will, we are in the question and answer from Unita Umpati. It's uh, a little bit more general. What are the views of Prof. Mendy and Prof. Simon regarding the development of education in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic? Is there any progress or is it the, the opposite? Thank you. Maybe Prof. Simon first. Okay, I was, I was hoping that maybe Amanda will answer first because it's, it's, it's a very good question, <laughs> a very difficult question. Yes. Um, so, it's, and what's also interesting is whether or not it's worth focusing our research on COVID-19. Um, so, you know, we have a situation where now where everyone is thinking about COVID-19. They're thinking about the implications of COVID-19, not only from a medical and health, but from in terms of workplace, in terms of culture, in terms of trust, even in terms of mental disease. So for example, you know, is, are people now be more likely to develop um, disorders because they're always washing their hands? Are they going to develop, you know, what we call um, obsessive compulsive disorders? I mean, there's so many implications. And an interesting question is, if you are wanting to undertake research, should you try to focus on the implications of COVID or should you not? You know, on the one hand, maybe you should, because of course there will be more funding and opportunities around COVID. Um, as I say, not just about health, but about everything else. On the other hand, that's also what everyone is doing. So in, to be unique, you might not want to focus. But my personal opinion is that actually, um, people, there will be more opportunities focusing on COVID-19, the research around that, and even the teaching around that than there was before, and that is worthwhile. In the short term, there's no doubt that people in Australian universities will start losing jobs. So there will be slightly fewer opportunities um, in the next year for PhD and, and potentially other research. Um, on the other hand, because of that, I think that people will now be really open to collaborating, not so much with PhD, but people, so for example, working uh, as many of you are currently in research um, because they're trying to find other ways of conducting research they hadn't before. So in some ways, there's probably many more opportunities, but maybe fewer opportunities for funding, at least for the next year or two. But uh, yeah, Amanda, I'd like to hear your opinion as well. Thank you. So more opportunity for funding. Uh, uh, one question for, from me is, uh, what is the strength of research area that Charles Darwin's university has now? I can answer. Amanda, did you yes. want to answer the previous question first? Uh, uh, um, no, my oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. So I yeah. can just yeah. add a little bit to that. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I think um, uh, some of the yes. early work that has been done in the primary school and the secondary school education system, um, 
is highlighting that different um, demographic groups and um, different wealth situations of families really influence the, how the students have learned during that homeschooling time. So I think when you're thinking about is there progress or is it opposite, I think um, there's winners and losers in that homeschooling. Um, and it reflects resource availability at home. It, it reflects how sort of stable the home life is and it reflects how much the parents were influenced by the change and whether they were all working from home too. So is it good or what were you saying, having, um, I've lost the one. Uh, is there progress or is it opposite? Um, I think the second, primary and secondary education system have seen some capabilities of online learning that they had never really explored before. So there might be a positive evolution from that as well, because there will be ways to do things that have, have we've been structured in a system that's been so defined and, and busy and no, no one's really been thinking too much outside of the box or just been doing it. So in some ways, this has taken, given people some time or some need to change practices and from that and go, well, that was interesting. So you've had an opportunity to do something different where you would normally not have had. And that, that there's where there's some that point that that question, research Funny. questions could be asked. Okay, Wendy, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, you can yeah. go, Wilma, okay. I finish now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Prof. Uh, Simon, we have uh, two questions on the chat room. First question is uh, from, I don't know who is the name here, Sal, Sal. I have sent some email to some professor about supervision inquiry and all was failed due to the several reasons such as overload supervising for PhD students and lack research of mine, even though in my perspective, I have enough research. Are all professors there Ha, there has a special criteria about numbers of research experience for PhD students candidates? Yeah, that's yeah. a very good question. Yes. So I, I mentioned before what the minimum criteria normally are, which is, you know, usually around, as I say, about six months of research, you know, in postgraduate. So it could be a master's. It could be a coursework master's where you've conducted research for half a year. But as Sally implied, Often academics, as in professors, will actually want people with more experience. Now, that's not because they, that it's necessary. It's because that many of the most popular professors are overwhelmed with uh, requests. So I think the best way to avoid that issue, and again, I'd be very interested in Amanda's view too, is firstly, try to find less experienced academics. They are not worse. They're often actually more supportive supervisors. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that there is something you gain from experience as well, but usually, as Amanda said, you'll be supervised by at least two people in Australia and usually more. And the main person that you speak to is often a younger person who is much more open to new PhD students. They're less likely to be overwhelmed with too many students. And when you do ask someone, certainly ask them whether or not they would recommend anyone else. Because some people are just busy and rude, but some people will feel guilty that they can't help and they'll try to recommend someone else for you. Um, and that's particularly true of the smaller universities. So I think, you know, Southern Cross, where Amanda is, uh, Charles Darwin University, where I are, I are, and there's probably about 10 to 15 other universities that are all very good research universities, but they are a bit smaller. Um, 
and they're not usually quite as overwhelmed with students as well. Um, but that's probably all I can really say. Yeah. Um, I suppose the other thing is, you know, if you can show a little bit more about a specific interest and why you've chosen that person, that's very helpful too. Partly because what you might want to know is that many people, many professors receive lots of emails that feel like it's from someone that's emailed hundreds of people. And this is quite common that someone will literally email lots of people. Now it's okay to email quite a lot of people, that's okay, but you should choose them. You should choose someone that's relevant to you. Some people would just basically email every, anyone because they just really want to do a PhD anywhere. They just want to come to Australia and they haven't really undertaken any research on that person and usually they will be rejected. So you need to show that you're, there's a reason why you've, you've asked that person, not because they will feel better about themselves, but, but just because then they know that you're genuinely interested in their work. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Moss. We, we still have uh, one question uh, from Devalina Lanit still from Fali. Fali asked about how to set up strong mindset for those who are looking for a chance to study abroad. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, I, I, should, I should know the answer to this question. I'm, I'm actually a psychologist, um, but it's not, it's not an easy question to answer. Basically, the main mindset you want to develop is one where you um, want to take risks because you want to learn something new. Um, and you need to be comfortable like making mistakes. That's okay. And admitting to people that you're not sure about things and even admit, ad admitting that you might be nervous and a bit anxious about the new environment. So being honest. And then you're here to just try to learn and challenge yourself. And as a consequence, you start to feel that you can change. You start to feel that, you know, that this could be new and that, that, um, and that the anxiety you feel now will change. And as soon as you start to feel that you can change and improve, then when problems arise, you don't feel concerned. You feel like this is an opportunity to improve rather than a threat that makes you feel bad. And one way of making sure that's likely to happen is to be a little bit clearer about um, what you want to be doing in five to 10 years time. Um, of course, you don't know exactly where you'll be and you don't know exactly what the research will be, but just to have a sense of the sort of person and you want to be and the sort of project you'd like to undertake in five to 10 years time. Because the research suggests that when, you, when you're sort of more thoughtful about your future and you can imagine your future vividly, then you tend to become more resilient to problems that arise when you travel to a new country. Thank, thank you. So we run out of the time, but uh, we still have one question for YouTube because now we are also uh, connected to YouTube uh, channel. So one question is from Pa Victor Lawalata. Should the six months research be published before a candidate apply to PhD program at Australian University? What do you think? It's, it's you're more likely to get a scholarship at least if it is published, definitely. So if you can publish, that's great. You may not need to publish for the minimum criteria. So you might be accepted, but as you know, most of you will probably want a scholarship, right? So most people who are studying in Australia will want a scholarship and then a publication will be very helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Prof. Simons, uh, about your informative uh, presentation, because we run out of the time. Sorry. So we will uh, turn to the third speaker, Ibu Tuti Krahayu from Australia, a word in Indonesia, because we already know how to write it down, uh, research grant proposal, and how to enroll for PhD program. And now we know how to apply for uh, scholarship. 
So uh, I will I will uh, introduce Ibu Tuti biography before we start for the third speaker. Okay, Ibu Tuti Rahayu, uh, she is graduate from uh, 99, uh, in 1995 from 11 Maret University Surakarta, Faculty of Liter Literature English Department for uh, graduate level, bachelor graduate level. She has over 20 years experiences working with donor agency, NGOs, international consultant, and regional and national level governments well experienced in managing participants of training and scholarship for short courses and master degree and PhD degrees program, including in country and overseas. So Ibu Tuti today will talk about uh, Australian Award Scholarship for lecturers and staff, especially for Patimura University lecturer and staff. To Ibu Tuti and we also have Ibu Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Ibu, Ibu Duya Anindia Sita, uh, a company Ibu Tuti together to give a lecture, uh, give a talk. Please, Ibu Tuti. Yeah. The time is yours now. Okay. Terima kasih. Thank you, Ibu Wilma. Uh, selamat sore semuanya. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to join this webinar so actually today is the, the last day the end of the day for the application for this round of uh intake 2000 application for this round Ibu. so i hope that the participant here in this web webinar will apply for the next round of the application for australia award scholarship so today we, we will present about uh, how to apply for the school apply Australia Award Scholarship. But before we discuss about the scholarship itself, uh, I would like to show you why is, uh, the government of Australia still concerned about about the education for the student from Indonesia because, as you know that not only Australia award that is provided by a uh, government of Australia, but they also have another scholarship. But for today, I will focus uh, discussing about the Australia award scholarship. Before we discuss about the scholarship, we, we want to show you why there are still many students from Indonesia who are interested to study in Australia. So Australia Award uh, capturing the result of survey and we found that still so many students in Indonesia interested to study in Australia. This is because of the, the fact that Indonesian students satisfied with the quality of study and living in Australia it show 91.1% mentioned about that. We also have uh, so many areas of studies in Australia, like 22,000 choices. It will be difficult to choose from that many areas of study. And then the fact that seven out of 10, uh, out of 100 best university in the world are in Australia and seven out of 100 best student cities in the world are in Australia too. So this is the fact that uh, that's still uh, the fact that why the student from Indonesia is still interesting to study in Australia. This also maybe the distance is close between Australia and Indonesia. So that's, that's why they still consider to study to Australia. And the opportunities of scholarship from government of Australia, there are Australia awards and also ACR, but I want to focus to discuss about the Australia award for this moment. 
in Australia awards, we uh, we consider that this is the longest running international scholarship program for Indonesia. We start still about uh, 1960, start with the Colombo plan and then uh, we used the name ADS, if you still remember with that program. And then 2014, we uh, we have the new name for the program with Australia Awards in Indonesia. Australia Awards actually provide two types of scholarship uh, for short-term award and the long-term award. The long-term award, uh, including master and PhD degrees in Australia. All the scholarship will be uh, provided for studying in Australia. We, di we didn't provide any scholarship to study in Indonesia. So why we call it international scholarship? Because uh, all the uh, students must go to Australia for pursuing the degrees. The objective for the program actually is to support uh, human development uh, in Indonesia. And this is the act of the collaboration between government of Indonesia and government of Australia. The long-term award, we, we have no age limit for applicants. So it's always the question, what age is the limitation? We have no limits for the applic applicant. So please apply for this scholarship even you already uh, 40 or 50. So we have no limit for the application. We have no limitation on the for frequency of applicants, applications. And each year, the number of the scholarship will be uh, adjusted with the decision of the budget from the government of Australia. But in this year, we, we have 250 postgraduate scholarship available. It consists of a PhD and master degree. This course will actually open for public, not only the lecturer, not only the government staff. This is open for public. But uh, like Ibu Wilma mentioned that yes, the, the lecturers are, uh, is available or uh, eligible to apply for this scholarship, especially the lecturer from uh, Maluku. Women and then people with disability and then the applicant from geographic focus area where Maluku is one of uh, the geographic focus area. We encourage from uh, that group of people to take the opportunity, opportunity to apply for this scholarship. Yeah. As mentioned by uh, Manda and Simon before, that when you prefer for, prepare for the application, you have to consider about the priority areas of the program. So here is the priority areas of school, uh, of Australia Award. The the first priority is the uh, the support to effective economic institution and infrastructure. So any kind of uh, field of study that that can be support the development of institution, economic institution and infrastructure. This is the first uh, priority. The second one is the the development of human resources for a productive and healthy uh, society, and then the third is the an inclusive. Uh, development through the uh, what we call it the good governance development. So please consider these three uh, priority areas when you want to apply for the scholarship. This is to prepare your research proposal and also to prepare your choice of field of study. Here is the example of the uh, field of study that can be covered by this uh, scholarship. Actually, almost all of the field of study can be proposed, but 
uh, we have three uh, priority areas that can be considered for the applicant to prepare the application. The example for the field of study for the human development for productive and healthy societies, all, all of you, all the field of study that related with the health and education that belong to the to this priority, and then all of the field of study that support for the uh, development of inclusive social through effective governance. This is including. Uh, legal, law, political science, government, public administration, public expenditure, etc. This is belong to the third priority. What is the entitlement for the scholarship? So uh, for the PhD student, all the, uh, all the costs will be covered by the scholarship start from the pre-departure. So we will start with the English for academic purpose, purposes in Indonesia. The training will be paid by Australia Award. The stipend will be provided during the uh, student attending this uh, training. Visa, medical examination, x-ray, health insurance expenses, they are provided from the scholarship. Domestic return airfare from the airport closest to the recipient home location to the EAP location, it will be uh, provided. Consultation with the representative universities. Assistance during the application to the university. And then support for uh, family visas. So this is all the entitlement to be provided before the departure and then during in Australia, all the budget should be covered by the scholarship, like written domestic and overseas travel expenses, introductory academic program in Australia, establishment allowance, living expenses in Australia or stipend, supplementary tutorial support. If the university uh, recommend the student to get supplementary tutorial support, and then the scholarship will uh, provide the support. Field work or research that will be uh, conducted in Australia or in Indonesia. And then support from liaison officer from the university. One will be, one staff will be dedicated from the university to the student during the study. And then the unit uh, reunion airfare in, for the minimum two years study duration student. This is all the entitlement uh, during study in Australia. And what is the benefit of upon return to Indonesia? The uh, the student be becoming the part of Australia Global Alumni Indonesia community, and they can have. Uh, access to to journal and then articles and ebooks. There's also a request from the chat before that how to get the e journal. Maybe that's the way you have to apply Australia Award and then you have to become the alumni for Australia Award and then you can get access to journal article and ebooks for free. This is all the benefit or entitlement for. Uh, the scholar and the application period for the uh, Australia Award Scholarship. Usually we, the opening is in uh, February and then the closing is in <clears throat> 30 of April. But this year with this condition, we extended the application until today, the 30 June uh, is the last day for the application. So today will be the big day for us to, to receive more, more uh, application for the final uh, submission. And you have to apply with the, by, by online application and two portals should be uh, completed. 
One is the online application by Oasis, and then the second is the additional information for online application that can be get from uh, Australia Awards website. You have to apply for the two portals because Oasis is provided for the global applicants and the applicants from Indonesia. Uh, you have to to add the information by by submit the application for the uh, additional information that can be get from the website. If you only uh, uh, apply using one portal, it can be uh, not it can make you not eligible to be proceed for the next level of selection process. So you have to be remember that the portal need to be to be fulfilled for this application. I want to uh, explain about the requirement for applying this scholarship, especially for the geographic focus area because you are in Maluku. Uh, you belong to geographic focus area. It's different requirement, especially for the minimum uh, GPA for Maluku. The minimum GPA is only 2.75 instead of 2.9 for other uh, applicants from other region. And the English proficiency for PhD, Tupel ITP is uh, 550. You can use Tupel ITP for the, uh, to apply for this scholarship. And then IELTS minimum is 6.0. You can use Tupel IBT 79, or you can use Pearson Academic 454. And for the PhD candidate, you will have the additional requirement, but this is the basic requirement for all applicants. Original IELTS, TOEFL, or Pearson certificate should be included. And then official or certified post-secondary and uh, S2 and S1 certificates or degrees. Curriculum vitae, most recent in English. Identity card or passport. You can choose either KTP or passport. Choose which one you have. You don't need to be worried about don't have passport, so you can use a KTP. And then birth certificate, atau usually we call it uh, akte kelahiran. If you don't have akte kelahiran, you can use the equivalent uh, certificate. You can use the certificate that is uh, issued by church, maybe. So uh, you can use that to replace the birth certificate or act of kelahiran. And then uh, official post-secondary and tertiary transcript of results. So for the ijazah and transcript, you have to get the certification from the school or from the university. But if you have difficulties to get the uh, uh, certification from the school or university, you can come to the local uh, notaries yeah? and you can get the certified from the local notary and then it is accepted to apply for Australia Award. Additional in, uh, requirement for PhD, uh, for the uh, PhD applicant, you have to include all the ijazah and transcript for S1 and S2. And then you have also uh, get the academic reference from master degree supervisor. And also you have to prepare your research proposal. You have to include this research proposal on your application uh, package. It's include about course detail, research title, research objective, proposed research methodology, and then fieldwork. Maybe this is not as complete as what Menda and Simon uh, explained about the research proposal, but 
the reviewer want to know what is your plan on the research proposal and we already provide the form and the minimum uh, characters that you can uh, fill out on the form about the information about the research proposal. Yeah, as also discussed before, yet, uh, Australia would also encourage and uh, highly desirable for doctoral applicants to have a letter of support from an Australian university for their proposed field of study. So it's like a potential uh, professor from university. And we need the proof of correspondence from uh, the applicant with the supervisor, potent super, uh, potential supervisor in uh, Australian university. This is to, to prove to the reviewer that you already have communication with, with the potential supervisor in, in Australia and you have already get a response from the supervisor or potential supervisor. This is as what uh, Simon already discussed before. And we, we uh, usually we get question about the applicant on how to start communication with potential, potential supervisor in Australia. And I think Simon already get, uh, give you the tips on how to start contacting the supervisor and how to, uh, to express your, uh, your interest to, to communicate with the supervisor. So don't worry about, about getting respond from the professor from the Australian university. We, we, we always get uh, feedback about, about this requirement. This is our cycle for the selection, but I think it's, uh, we can skip this. Yeah. We also, uh, for your information, that we also have a, <clears throat> a workshop that we call a proposal writing workshop before the application is open. So the, uh, the workshop target is the PhD applicant. Usually we do it in two location. This is to support our target applicants from targeted areas uh, including geographic focus area so we conduct one day research proposal writing workshop usually we do it on february or early march and we invite applicant to send the interest and then we will select 60 uh, participants for the workshop in the workshop, we will discuss about the draft proposal and we uh, invite the professor from one of the university in Australia to give feedback about the research proposal and then like one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultation. We also invite two uh, trainers or facilitators from, from Indonesia. So, so the the participant, they can consult about the draft proposal and they can get uh, feedback from the facilitator about draft proposal they, they already prepared. This is the one day workshop and this is only for the candidate of uh, PhD applicants that we provided for the applicant from targeted area. So I think this is all the requirement and how to apply for the scholarship Australia Award scholarship as well as especially for the PhD program Ibu Wilma I think it's time for discussion and yeah silahkan Ibu I will stop the share now thank you very much Ibu Tuti for informative uh, presentation uh, yeah, as on the agenda, we already at the 
end of the time, but I think that we need to expand a little bit more, some minutes. Uh, so we, we will turn to the question and answer session for Ibututik as a speaker. We have one question now. Is there any chance of, from Renata Nikiyulu, Ibu Renata, hi Ibu. Is there any chance of support for PhD candidate to receive an English assistance like ELTA? Because as we know, ELTA is only for uh, S1 or bachelor students, yeah, Ibu Tuti. But Nindya, silakan maybe okay. share. Okay, Ibu Nindya, please. Yeah. Okay, so um, I will help to answer the question from Ibu Renata, which happens to be one of our ELTA trainers, actually. So um, at this moment, at the moment, ELTA program is only for uh, master applicants because what we can cater is three months program and uh, it will relate to the requirement of English for a master degree, it's slower than the PhD uh, degree, uh, obviously. So uh, we see from uh, master applicants in Indonesia, there are more needs of uh, English uh, capability. So what we can assist in this matter is uh, provide providing an English training assistance for master uh, applicant. And then uh, and then we, we uh, it is team for master graduates in Indonesia to have a specific level of English, a better level of English than a graduate from S1 or from Sarjana. So it's a different form of assistance. That's why in Australia, what's in Indonesia, what we can help or assist uh, for PhD applicants is uh, to provide a research proposal writing workshop as Ibu Tuti mentioned before. Uh, jadi RPWW yang kita berikan itu workshop untuk menulis proposal itu adalah bantuan kami untuk uh, PhD applicants begitu. So we basically see the needs and then the kind of assistance that we can provide for uh, in this instance. Master degree needs more English capability and uh, PhD applicants needs more skill in writing a good research proposal. So that's why we assist in this kind of um, need by creating or holding a workshop for potential applicants for PhD level. Begitu Ibu Renata. Okay, I hope uh, Ibu Renata here about the, the answer. And thank you Ibu, Ibu Nidia. We have uh, one question from YouTube channel. The question is, is LOA or letter of uh, acceptance very influential on scholarships from Australia government. Does LOA, if we get it, is said to meet the university requirements? Okay. okay. Bye. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very one of the most frequently questions uh, that asked to Australia Awards. Australia Awards scholarship is uh, kind of different from um, other scholarship schemes in Indonesia. We know that a lot of scholarship requires applicants to have letter of acceptance or, or letter of um, offer from university, but it's not the case with Australia Awards. We do not require applicants to have letter of um, acceptance from university because uh, the system, because once the applicant is elected to get uh, our scholarship, Australia Awards will help them to apply directly to the university. So at the moment, um, at the application stage, uh, we do not require applicants to include LOA. Um, and, but if they do have uh, LOA already, they can uh, attach it to their application, but it doesn't add their um, value, value or it doesn't um, add the marking or assessment when they are shortlisting or um, in the selection process. Thank you, Ibu Nindya. We still have a question, uh, two questions left. Uh, ELTA 2020 will be held online <laughs> class or offline class. Thank you. This is a very, um, very good question <laughs> because everything is not clear at the moment. We are hoping that uh, ELTA 2020 will be held offline. Um, 
but we already uh, moved the dates to so originally it's held in september to december 2020 but since the pandemic and we know that people cannot travel and we cannot uh, interview people at the moment because we have to fly around the country uh, so we moved the dates to january to march 2021 so hopefully um, the pandemic is over by uh, then uh, and we can still hold ELTA and other program, Australia was program, the pre-departure trainings before they depart to Australia and uh, many other courses uh, that we hold. We, we hope that we can uh, proceed normally. Thank you, Ibu Ninja. And I think this is the last question for this session. Uh, how about TOEFL certificate? Is, is that must reason one, the reason one, uh, or how long the duration time of expiration date? Right, okay. Yeah. It's another good question. So the rule of thumb is that we can, uh, Australia Awards will accept um, English certificates that last two years um, from the closing application date. So for example, our original closing date of application is 30, 30th of April 2020, right? So what we can uh, accept is for any TOEFL or IELTS certificate that is at least, uh, that was at least taken in 30th of April 2018. So two years before the application uh, closing date. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Nidia and Ibu Tuti. Uh, because we are we have a limited time over now so uh i we will hear the next session for only three minutes so to motivate our spirits to study or to do research overseas i will invite mrs endang jamal who will deliver her testimonial experience to do phd at southern cross university under supervision prof mandy to Mrs. Endang Jamal, the time is yours for three minutes, please. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Milma. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for having. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> As you know, my name is Endang Jamal. I am from um, Faculty of Marine Science and Fisheries. Patimura University and now I'm conducting my PhD study at Southern Cross University at School of Environment, Science and Engineering. Um, and I'm proud to let you know that I'm working with Mandy as my principal supervisor. We are looking at pesticide and trace metal contamination in estuary and ecotoxicology responses of oysters and phytoplankton. I'd like to thank you, uh, to thank Australia Award Scholarship and Australia Award Indonesia for giving me this prestigious scholarship. Uh, for me to get this scholarship, it, is, it was a long journey because my lack in English proficiency. First time I took my English preparation, I mean IELTS, provided by Higher Education Ministry in 2011 with Miss Milma as my roommate for months. And the second, secondly, in 2018 in Yogyakarta provided itself from um, Ministry of Research and Higher Education. So I got, this is to, uh, there's two calls for increase my uh, score from five to six. That's the most challenge for us from East Indonesia. <laughs> I mean, um, and I failed, uh, I mean, I was unsuccessful in 2017 when I applying for a certain award scholarship because I didn't fill out the portal from Oasis. <laughs> but um, luckily in 2018, I tried it again and I'm passed. So a um, couple of things that uh, I noticed are important to share with you based on my experience. Uh, firstly, it is important to uh, provide our required document early. Um, far before application period, I think it is better than in hurry times. Uh, you know, sometimes some document in case in Indonesia or in Ambon may take longer time than you expect. And secondly, um, mastering your research proposal. 
because it has to do uh, with some question in online form. And also when you pass your selection documents, um, you will do some interview and they will explore you how you mastering your um, research proposal, uh, things to be concerned such as how's your back, I mean, how's your uh, background education on or your work experience can back up your pursuing study and how you propose study can develop, or I mean, can contribute to develop or can solve problem in your country or your region professionally and personally. And I think last but not least, because it is just minutes, so just briefly, uh, asking friends, colleagues, seniors, who had good in English based on my experience for proofreading or any related information about Australian scholarship to those who have experience in Australian about scholarship. So I think the best word for my journey is perseverance. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, um, Ms. Endang. Perseverance. Yes, yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Endang, for the talk. Uh, for your talk, is broadening and developing our new perspective for studying overseas or doing research overseas. Uh, we are almost at the end of the webinar. Uh, before we close, I beg to three speakers and to invite them to present the closing statement only for one minute. I start with Prof. Amanda, please, Prof. Mandy. That's, that's a little bit, um, wasn't expecting that. Um, well, I just want to say to everybody that's out there um, that um, the world is your oyster. Um, work hard, get good results. And um, if you came to study and further your study, there's lots of wonderful opportunities, but also it's a long-term game. And I think Endang made that point that um just and we all fail with getting grants everybody does like i think that's the one of the big common things between every researcher everybody's failed in getting a grant and you know you will one day be successful too so just persevere and i think um and improve as you persevere as well and good luck to everybody Thank you very much, Prof. Mandy. Uh, and now, Prof. Moss, one minute for a closing statement, please. No problem. No problem. I had a minute to prepare, unlike Amanda, so it was a bit easier. Um, I suppose my advice for PhD would be to, to take a risk. Don't, don't think you have to find the perfect topic or the perfect circumstance. It's never going to be perfect. You'll probably be a little bit excited by what you do, but also a little bit bored by what you do, regardless. Um, you'll have some highs and lows. So it's something just to go for and not worry about too much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Prof. Moss. Uh, and now for Ibu Tuti, please, Ibu, one minute uh, closing statement. Thank you, Wilma. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> my, our message is that when the opportunity is provided for you to get this to apply and then to try it. And please uh, please be uh, careful to read through all the requirement because it's a scholarship scheme. They have different uh, requirements. So when you want to apply scholarship, uh, Australia Award, Award Scholarship, you have to read through what the requirement they uh, they are expected, and then don't be mixed with other scholarship requirement or other scholarship scheme. So you have to be focused on that on that requirement. Sometimes you ask about you asking something that is expected by other scholarship, but not expected by our scholarship. So be be careful to. Uh, to pay attention for the for the requirement of its scholarship scheme. Mungkin Mbak Nindya ada juga. Ibu Nindya, one minute, Ibu. Um, 
maybe um, I would like to remind everybody that the scholarship, our scholarship, Australia was scholarship, one of the key words uh, there uh, that is always sounded is about development. So make sure that your research or your topic really contribute to the development of Indonesia and also contribute to the relations that we have, bilateral relations we have between Indonesia and Australia. Um, and good luck. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Nindya and Ibu Tutik. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your participation in this seminar. Like what Ibu Tutik, Prof. Simon, Prof. Amanda, and Ibu Nindya said, so many chances available. Be brave, take the risk. It's okay to make mistakes, but don't forget to enjoy the journey. Hope there will be more PhD graduates from Maluku for a better future. Okay. Uh, once again, I will say I would like to say thank you for our speakers, Prof. Doc, Professor Dr. Amanda Raquel Brasset, Professor Dr. Simon Emos, Mrs. Tutik Rahayu, and Mrs. Dwiya Anindya Sita, who has been willing to participate in this online seminar by giving very important and beneficial material for us. Thank you very much for staying with us until the end of the online seminar. We will have a photo session we'll, which will be captured by Snipping Tools. Sorry, because we are on, online. The International Office host will capture our picture. So please hold your position. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Ivan, please announce if you're ready. Uh, turn on your video and have a pose. Yeah, one, three, say yes. one, two, and three. Uh, once again, uh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Now uh, we are on the closing statement. Uh, our rector, Professor MJ Sapteno SHM, who uh, uh, says his apology for can for uh, not closing this uh, event because he has to lead a worship uh, this evening. So I would like to invite our vice rector of planning, cooperation and information system, Dr. Muspida to deliver a closing statement to Dr. Muspida, the time is yours. And thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to attend our online seminar with the title, The Way to Study Oversized Writing Research, Grant Proposal and Pursuing PhD Degree. Special thanks you to our speaker, Professor Dr. Simon uh, from Charles Darwin University, Professor Amendi from Southern Cross University, Australia, and Ms. Tutik Rahayu and Ms. Dibia, an initiative from Australia Awards uh, Scholarship Indonesia. Augusta participation uh, of this online seminar. <clears throat> this seminar br uh, brings you much information and hope will bring benefits to students or lectors who want uh, to push for the future uh, education abroad and even, and even uh, conduct research abroad, we really support that. This is implementation of the university partnership with institution uh, outside of why we have signed FCLE today. We are very thankful for being able to hold this webinar with Unpatis collaboration with Southern Cross University, Charles Darwin University, as, as uh, well as the Australian Award. After this, we will also hold uh, other seminars from various uh, countries and 
uh, continues with university around the world. And in July, we will also hold a webinar uh, by bringing in different source with a different topic for up at one year. And <clears throat> is this a pandemic con condition? There may be more this. We will do it this collaboration. Once again, thank you to all the speaker and participants. Finally, by saying thanks to uh, and make good, I officially close this online seminar. I see, I close uh, by saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin, and Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Muspida. Uh, thanks, thanks again to the speakers and participants. Uh, I have an important thing to say. If you would like to have a recording of this event, please feel, feel, feel free to send us email through uh, io.unpati at gmail.com. We will provi uh, provide the recording, which will be active only for three days. And also for the certificate, the committee will send you through your email address. Uh, and if you would like to have a, a email address of Prof. Mandy and uh, Prof. Simon Moss, and also probably good to take, uh, please, uh, please feel free to send us an email to io.unpati at gmail.com. Okay, let, that's the end of uh, this webinar. Again, thank you very much for all uh, speakers who already participate, participate to this uh, webinar and also for the participants. Thank you, Ibrahim. Prof. Mendy, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Prof. Simon Moss, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Ibu Tutik, thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu India. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And all participants, see you on the next webinar on the 2nd of July from uh, Europe session. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Good morning. Bye. Selamat sore. Ibu Endang, selamat sore. I leave this meeting. Thank you. Ibu Endang, selamat sore. Bye-bye. Selamat sore. Mau bilang untuk kata kalau ke, apa tinggal di ya, kembar untuk minta untuk nomor hp eh, wa dulu supaya bisa share ini dengan itu. Kalau apa ibu Christine di Harbour kayak gitu. Adiri. Ya, abang Hazyudin. Salam. Salam. Semua lekan. Ya. Ya. Per dua baru muncul dari mana nih? Baru bangun tidur nih? Bos. Halo. Maaf bisa saya rapat yang itu. Oh iya iya. Mantap saya. Bantari lampu mati tuh. Iko iko sampai lagi iko iko sini jadi kita lagi sampai iko sana balik sini iko sini. Betul betul. Akan sesuai dan tanggung jawab tu. Lain. Balik lampu mana? Berhabis pidato untuk pidato. Iya, anda su menghilang itu. Okay. Okay. Tiba tu mau bicara ni berapa pada tu. Ya, ada. Ya, sampai besok kan? Bagaimana bahasa Inggris?
itu baca bagus tuh ya cuma tadi ada kata-kata sulit bilang tuh saya ini ya bapak itu sekeren sudah tuh 